What's up everybody? It's your boy Rogue Recon or Taylor and uh, today we're doing something a little different. Uh, we're doing a podcast for a project of mine for class. Uh, thank you to my professor for giving me this opportunity to do this. I find it very creative and gave me a better way of presenting my knowledge. Uh, today I am joined by Eric, my friend. Say hello, hello. Eric. There we go. <laughs> and uh, today we're going to be covering entertainment technology. Uh, Entertainment technology has been around for, I wouldn't say forever, but the fact of using technology to entertain us without using cards or board games is cool. Or books. Books, that too. I mean, people still read books, but that's beside the point. Anyways. Well, yeah, people still read books, Taylor. <laughs> I'm not saying reading books are bad. I'm just saying I'm sure it's about that. not on the top of everybody's list, things, list of things to do. But That is true. For now, we're going to be talking about the history of radio broadcasting and television, along with some of their impacts on society now and how they became the thing. So starting us off, uh, the history of radio broadcasting. Uh, it started probably, the idea itself probably started around the mid, late 1800s, the brink of starting the 20th century. Uh, we had an Italian inventor name. I'm going to butcher his name, but it's Guglio Gu, Gugli. It's an Italian name. I'm going to, it's whatever. It's a Marconi, Mr. Marconi. We're going to call him Mr. Marconi for this point. Uh, in the mid, late 1800s. Wasn't Marconi a, like, name of a, no, that's, I'm thinking of the Batman movie that Marconi yeah. is a crime boss. <laughs> <laughs> this is real. No, Batman now he's just a guy real. who does. Oh, he's just the guy that does radio. He's just he, he's been credited for the invention of radio broadcasting and transmitting signals. It's really interesting that the Italian government had no interest in in his idea. So he was just some guy in a shop. He was like, you know what would be fun? Making radio. Yeah, pretty much. Like he just like brought it to their government and they're like he's like, Hey, this is a great idea. Like we can do this. Hey, so I have this thing. Would you want to maybe do the thing? And they're like, sorry, we don't want your time. And he's like, bummer. I'll just move to England. And he goes bummer. to he goes Guess to I'll go to England. Goes to England, asks them about it, and they fund him. And that's kind of where it starts off. Now, like most things, um, the United States likes to take a lot of ideas and make it our own. And so, another piece of this history lesson that I'm giving you guys, um, the RCA, the Radio Corporation of America. So, once they found out about Mr. Marconi's ideas in England, they were like, let's take his ideas and make it our own. And so, they founded General Electric in 1919. And oh, I've, I've heard... I've heard of that, but where have I heard? I heard of it outside of like talking about, like talking about like entertainment technology. Yeah, it's like most of these companies we've well have heard of before, and they're they're pretty much everywhere. yeah. I think you, I think it was in like my one of my history classes where they're just like yeah, and then General Electric did this. Yeah, like a lot of these companies pretty much came in and tried to literally take over everything. Like this was like before everything was like regulated like monopolies were still large but... oh good old rockefeller <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right so anyways so pretty much they stole the idea from marconi and acquired his i guess i wouldn't say it was a patent he didn't patent it but they pr took the idea and because actually Mar actually fun fact because marconi only was the only one at the time handling commercial radio like doing transmissions or yeah transmitting like information and stuff cross sea and um they didn't they didn't like that so they they thought this little man was not not what they uh, they didn't want him was having he everything. little though was he little i mean isn't there a stereotype that italians are short Oh, Taylor, hitting up this. I'm the saying Italian stereotype. Star. I'm not saying this is true. I'm saying, aren't they? Isn't that right? I'm well, probably wrong. Hang on. What was this guy's name? Marconi? Yeah. You can find his name. You're going to Google it real quick? Marconi. <laughs> I'm curious. 
Oh, yeah, he's like, got a Wikipedia page. Fantastic. Ooh. Let's see. Does it actually show how tall he was? I don't want to say I'm wrong. I mean, I want to say I'm wrong, but I'm also just going to want myself to be wrong. Because I'm, I'm not a big fan of stereotypes myself. <laughs> oh, I'm looking at the Wikipedia page. It says known for radio. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what he is. But also, we, we can't always rely on Wikipedia. You know, while, while you're looking that up, I'm going to keep going and talking about this. So, uh, you know, you have uh, the RCA and other corporations dividing, conquering smaller companies and buying them and using their information, their ideas. Yes. So with all this going on, the federal govern government in the United States is like, yo, we need to regulate this. His so, height is unknown. That's tough. <laughs> we will no never one know. No one bothered stereotype. to check how tall the guy who invented radio was. That's crazy. I feel like I've been robbed. We've been robbed of information. This was crucial information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly. So, the uh, federal research government. research down the tree. Honestly, like, years of information were like, hey, we have to know his height. And we don't know his height. That is the big takeaway. We will never know what, what Mr. Marconi's height is. What if I was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And the final question was, what was Marconi's height? And I'd have to sit there and scramble for my answer because I couldn't look it up. Wikipedia will never help us. It never has, and it never will. <laughs> True. So, going on, the federal government of the United States uh, added more regulations. So, they created the Radio Act of 1927. So, once uh, radios kind of blew up a little bit with, you know, General Electric, Marconi doing all their stuff, they're like, hey, we gotta regulate this. So, this also was created by the federal government's, I guess you could say department. I want to say department. I'm just going to say Federal Communications Commission. Um, if you've heard of them before, I'm, I, I don't know anybody who hasn't heard of them because they've been, I wouldn't say recently, but in the past year and a half or two, they've been pushing down on uh, copywriting and like, you know, uh, so, okay, music. This might come as a shock to you, but I had no idea who they were. What? I, yeah, I don't think. Maybe because I've been on YouTube for a little bit, but they basically have been doing a lot of copyright strikes and not just copyright strikes, but making sure that things that shouldn't be seen by little kids be seen by little kids. So, like... Oh, hold whole, on. Were they the guys that did the... Were they part of the whole, like, YouTube, like... Armageddon. When YouTube cracked down and, like, oh, you will get fined, like, $38,000 if yes. you don't... That was them? That was them. They were the ones who basically said if a child who is under 18 sees something on YouTube that is not restricted, the person who made that video or said that certain thing online is going to be fined. And that was, I believe, the max that they could fine you for. So yeah, like, it was up to $38,000, which was a little ridiculous. It was ridiculous. I, I made, like, posts about it all the time because I was fearing for my life because I thought I'd posted something because I, I have some things on my channel that probably shouldn't be seen. There's actually a lot of things on my channel that things that little kids under 18 shouldn't see. But also, it's part of the parents that need to be watching their kids and seeing what they see. They need to... They need, it's, not, it's not the government's, like, problem. It should be the right, parents you, to... We're, we're that. out here talking about... Um... Uh, entertainment technology but people gotta like yes the technology is there but you also gotta like self-regulate yeah you can't just you just can't walk rely on through and government. that's a lesson for everybody don't rely on your government oh <laughs> that's a whole other story <laughs> <laughs> all right so with the uh federal communications commission uh with all these regulations with the radio act of 1927 uh, there was a lot of radio stations already existing between this time of like 1919 and 1927. You have a bunch of people booming, being like, yeah, we can make radio stations and broadcast whatever we want. So you had a bunch of different frequencies and being things being transmitted. And it just was not cool because things were getting crossed over and like you'll be listening to like your daily news and then you'll have some like pop music come out of nowhere like that kind of situation if that makes sense so there was like over 600 channels like just in the united states that doesn't seem like a lot 
But well, now isn't it? it it's down by a lot. Yeah, because it's been regulated. It's like to make sure there's only specific ones. You have your like main channels. So if you like your big corporations, you have like NBC, NBC, MSNBC as well. You have Fox. I mean, everyone has their own little radio <clears throat> station, and you can go listen to them. They want to make sure that those people, the mainstream people who had the money to pay for it, were able to a lot of those get radio, their stuff out. Don't a lot of those radio stations like also have like TV networks, like yes. MSNBC? That's now that's what we're we're gonna find that like in the history information, the lessons that I have kind of slowly put together for us to talk about today. Um, we really do see that a lot of the corporations uh, intertwine. They try to do everything to make the most money to get the most viewers that's what it all came down to now along with those 600 channels there is only 40 high-powered channels now that's what i was talking about when i was saying they needed people they were paying to get the best because they were mainstream and they wanted to make sure they were getting the best quality people can hear them wherever they were at so they had 40 high-powered channels with networks to run on, while 37 of them were, like, specific. So, like, you had people paying, and then you had people who just were well-known enough to have their own channel. And then you had the rest of the 500-and-something channels to uh, fight over, pretty much. Like, I, I, I guess you could say, like, you had your, like, daily, you know, your, like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll say daily, daily channels... And then after that segment was over, you had a different channel come on. Or, like, different station. I say channel and station flip-flopped, but it's, like, station to station. They used the same actual channel. And when oh, each so segment like was how, over... like, different, like, TV shows will play? Yes. That's, that's actually a really good way to explain it. So, like, you had one channel, and each show had their own time. And after that time, the next one would come on. Basically like that. Oh, and, and then, like, the whole, like, radio program thing. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? Because I remember that in, um, in A Christmas Story. <laughs> yeah. Right? He was always like, and it was always on at this time, and then, like, he would go and listen to it. Yeah. There were scheduled times. I mean, it's literally TV and radio channels. <clears throat> you had your time, and then the next one comes on. And it's cool with these all these like companies, corporations, and networks. Most of them gained seventy percent of the shares of like the U.S. broadcast listeners. It was really it was really interesting. Like they, with all these people paying, people pay for the radios. You get what I'm saying? Like they bought them, they paid. Well, the yeah, they, they they pay for the actual radio, but then they had to pay like like a cable fee. Pretty much. It was weird. It was. It seemed a little excess, but it wasn't... It was, like, um, very... Very privileged to have radios. Like, you know when, um... Like, right now with the, uh, Xboxes and Playstations. The series... The new, uh, generation of consoles. It's a privilege to have the newer ones because they're... Very, um... Well, their... Their hardware's a lot better. They load yes. faster, all that fun stuff. But you can still get by with the older one. Yes. But it wasn't the best, and it wasn't what everyone wanted at the time. Everyone wanted the newest thing... But it wasn't accessible to everyone. Not because of the demand, but because of materials and et cetera, et cetera. I'm kind of getting off trail. But my point is, um, a lot of these networks were able to get the money and profit like a lot. Like they had 70% of the shares just from all these people. But like the one thing, like when I was talking about what, the 600 channels and people had to basically have their time segments or they just weren't going to get their time on. And like you had different channels enter meet, intersecting and... You'll be listening to your news, and then you'll get music all of a sudden. Or, like, when you're changing different, like, uh, I don't want to, I don't think it's area codes, but certain areas, like, if you're driving, let's say, to the mountains. Let's say we're going from Raleigh, North Carolina, to Asheville, North Carolina, like, separate sides of the state. You'll get halfway there, and your radio station will change because you're out of that area for that station. That channel will change to whatever's closest and whatever's <clears throat> running on that, at that channel at the time. Yeah, so, area. actually, that's still... Right, because I have one of those um, uh, music, like, I have a thing in my car that I, like, plug in, and yes. it hijacks one of the radio stations so I can play music from my phone via Bluetooth. Yes. Right, and if I, like, if I drive to the beach, I have to switch what radio station it uses, because otherwise it just crackles with static. That is true. Because the station that I was using is a, 
being used by something else. In that other area. In the other area. Yeah. So with that being said, um, those are considered non-profit. I, or at the time, they're considered non-profit, so like, they weren't getting funded for it. They were just anybody who like, supported them. Like, your supporters, they were pretty much paying for this. So like the be funded now though is the question. Um, I think most of these. Or are like, they still nonprofits? I think some of them are still nonprofit, and then some of them are semi, pro or semi getting funded from the government to stay alive or like whatever head company. Because I'm assuming like you have your umbrella company, and then you have multiple different stations with different hosts, co-host ideas, topics they cover, news they cover. But it's under the same parent company, like um. Facebook's meta company like that's their umbrella their umbrella company the parent company who owns Facebook Instagram WhatsApp and whatever is out there whatever other gaming apps they also have Oculus um, all of those are under umbrella by meta which is the new parent name I don't know what the other one was called I think it was called Facebook still but my point is um, they they would get their funding from them. I'm assuming that's how it is now. But okay. uh, we're going to Speaking of the that. Facebook yeah. change to meta, that's going to confuse the crap out of my grandparents. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But with this <clears throat> change, with these reg government regulations where they had um, specific channels and stations play on certain channels and you know, pay for it with either profiting from listeners or getting your supporters to pay for you or you're getting funded by the actual federal government uh, a lot of these companies ended up selling their smaller stations at the time radio corporate corporation of america still had their stuff and they ended up selling um their network the nbc blue network which i found there was a lot of different like they were color-coded like there was they were red, there was red and blue and they got rid of blue I don't know why they got rid of blue, but well, yeah, it, maybe it was, it was the uh, the owner had a very he had a red, his hair yeah. color was red, so he's like, like, we can sell the blue one. I like red. <laughs> At this point, you never know, but it was it comes all the way down to like trying to regulate people from not being able to run everything. Like you just don't want one company owning everything, being an, like a monopoly. Yes, hmm. they wanted the radio systems like this whole entertainment new development and entertainment technology they didn't want it to be monopolized how like you know the industrial revolution was in america <laughs> like everything else robber barons <laughs> anyways so that happened and then we had another little thing the communication act of 1934 that was fun was it little though a little, yeah. It just I kind guess. of bunked down more on anti-monopolistic regulations so people couldn't run everything and own everything. So it gave smaller... Just stations. more trust-busting, basically. Yes, that is true. Okay. It gave people ch a chance to get out there and make money. And then we're going to go ahead and talk about the impacts. These, they're, they're pretty cool. I think it's really cool. The impacts of radio broadcasting is beyond me. Because we still use it today. It's cool. It's amazing. Um, I have written down social, cultural, and political impacts. Now, I'll just go ahead and say right now, the television impacts do inter inter intervene with these. It's not. Well, a I would imagine their impacts are going to sound weirdly similar. Oh, yeah. When I'm definitely, I, I won't say that now. They do definitely sound the same. But that's okay. I have because the I, I I know one of the impacts for the TV, mm -hmm. right? Um, the debate between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. There you go. We'll we'll live, wait. We'll hold televised. that. Yeah, we'll hold that till we get the impacts of television. So impacts of radio broadcasting. I will definitely say that radio gave listeners a way to keep up with like events in their towns and cities. Like instead of just having to rely on a newspaper that came every day or weekly for something that could have happened days before so it wasn't exactly relevant at that time so you can say let's give an example 
the Ohio Mississippi River floods of like 1937. Like it was crazy. A lot of destruction. I mean, I wouldn't say it's like as bad as like we have hurricanes now, but like I didn't really see any hurricane data or actual like big things that really gave an impact. I mean, I probably could have found something, but the big thing was like these broadcasts gave like actual interviews of people who were affected and like described the area of what of like what it looked oh, like. Oh no, Ohio flooded. What a shame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, people didn't, like, think about it this way. Our generation is able to see literally everything everywhere. Back then, not everybody That's had not a camera. That's true. Well, for the, I'm going to say for the most part. I'm, I'm, I'm everything most everywhere, part. Taylor? That's a very blanket statement. I, I'm, I'm saying, I'm just going to generalize for the most part. Just, um, oh, you're going to generalize. Yes, generalize. It's an example. It's not actually, like... 100% true. That was not supposed to be a, a statement like a fact. Let's just say... <laughs> we have a lot more access to information now. Yes. That is that is a much better way to put it. Um, pretty much with the river floods, the interviews were able to... The interviewers gave the interviewees the information to project to the rest of the area that may have not been affected, but they could support them by sending money and funds to rebuild those areas or food and, or water yeah i mean it's really cool like how they did this like i mean they still do it now but not as like dramatic because we have cameras and tv i mean that tv then but not in the way we do have now but yeah, they, they would have to really like describe what was happening there yeah people were more creative with how they used their words <laughs> <laughs> They were talking like Tolkien. Yes. <laughs> um, another Three thing. Three pages to describe one scenery. What a honestly, guy. It's crazy. Like, you can have a whole book of describing a topic. Like, just imagine, like, someone had a newspaper and used the whole newspaper to describe one single picture. And you can always say a picture can describe a thousand words, but that's not exactly what I'm trying to say here. Now, the question is, though, is that did they take a picture and then bring it to the guy in the radio station so he could look at the picture and describe what he was seeing? Well, most things were interviews. There so were a lot of interviews? They were, they were first-person views. So they go up to people who were in these areas and ask them about what happened, how were they affected, how could you help, or just... How they were See, feeling but I at think that time. Wasn't back then the tech? It was like it was too bulky to carry around like we do nowadays. Yes. So they, so they have would a, write down the interview and yeah. then bring it back and then talk. Yeah, they had a, like a little journal with questions, and then they wrote down the person's name, who they were, where they were living, and wrote down everything they told them, and then they go back to their station, try to sum it up or say word for word, which honestly was pretty cool because you. Couldn't, well, you could still lie, but it wasn't, like, on your mind. You wanted to make sure it made sense, people understood it, people cared, and people would fund the cause to help those people. So another thing I'd like to bring up, um, along with being able to keep up with events, uh, people, listeners, wanted to, you could say, escape reality how people escape reality by playing video games or hopping on their virtual reality headset or just watching tv in general um they like to listen to stories and broadcasting gave the ability to people for radio hosts and stations to read stories and um to large audiences because radio reached a large audience of people like a whole area like an area code like that's pretty oh, large you right Oh, imagine that though. Like you're sitting there, like someone's re make like telling a story over the radio, and then they just cut it short, and then it goes straight to like some weird baking radio <laughs> radio show. <laughs> well, actually, it's kind of funny. So, in 1938, I believe it was the Hall Halloween night. Actually, um, a radio broadcast station decided to. Do a world War of Worlds adaptation by Orson Welles. Now it was that pretty was much, a mistake. Yes. Now this was, I mean, the idea was cool, but people thought it was real for the fact that 
the war war and worlds was basically a book about like alien invasions and so a bunch of, a bunch of people thought the the planet was being invaded on halloween and, uh, yeah pretty much like it was it was great timing it was halloween night they were talking about alien invasions and to put a twist on it they put in news reports like someone acted out news reports of the aliens invading and apparently some people didn't realize it was a book and thought it was real and thought the world was going to end it was actually really funny i mean it's not funny at the time but like i think it's funny no now. In, hindsight, in hindsight it's very funny yes like that's that's how it's cool i think it's cool they were able to be very creative and basically act out a book they read a book over the radio and allowing people to understand the book. It's just entertaining people. That's literally what it is. And it's cool. And so, with that being said, you also have not just books, but also music was being broadcasted. I mean, music has always been around. and Most of the time, you go in person to see it. But nowadays, you listen to it on your phone, and concerts are still awesome to go to, which I've only been to. Yes, gone to. are the days of dressing up in your finest silks and sitting in a hot, stuffy room to listen to Mozart on the <laughs> piano. <laughs> but with this oh, development... Oh, what a shame. Uh, huh? Oh, what a shame. Oh, uh, what a shame. But with this development of music over the radio, it just allowed millions upon millions of people just to be able to enjoy different songs and hear popular songs that were probably popular on the west coast and not on the east coast or in the midwest people were able to listen things listen to things that you couldn't hear in maine for example but with radio you were able to be able to listen to these songs by radio i mean if you're not from that area you're not gonna i mean it also kind of gave rate gave rise to the to genres of rock and roll and stuff like that. Yeah. And then MTV, oh boy. <laughs> That's a whole nother, whole nother well, the spiel. Creation, the creation of the music video. Yeah. Right, that was, there's That's like half a museum dedicated to it. Yeah. Unfortunately, we're not going to cover that today, but if you guys want me to make another podcast, we can definitely do a whole spiel on MTV and that i mean it's a whole the like, fall from grace <laughs> yeah 100 percent. Right, so now they just they just do like reality shows yeah pretty much no stop it you'd be like MTV you, were, you were more you were better <laughs> what happened <laughs> you stay up till like my dad always tells me he used to stay up till midnight to see the release of like different like songs and their music videos i think even um was it Michael Jackson's Thriller, I think? You stay up till midnight on... I don't remember when Thriller released. I'm just going to say Halloween for an example because it just makes sense. He released it on a Halloween night. And music videos fact back then... Fact check that? I might have to fact... Yeah, please fact check that for me. Um, Just for time being, I'm going to say Halloween. Halloween when night, it releases. When was the Thriller video release? Released, let's see. Michael Jackson's Thriller... It says it was released in 1983. But it doesn't say day or anything? Hang on. It says year? Hang on. Alright. On... December 2nd? Oh. Okay, never mind. What? Then. We're gonna... Hang on. <laughs> what? For a... Halloween-ish themed song now? Actually, was that yeah. in the purpose of it to be 33 years ago on december 2nd mtv aired the full 13 minute version of michael jackson's thriller music video for the first time oh wow so it wasn't on halloween it was in I, december I, I for some reason thought it was the, the halloween song was released yes. at, around christmas time <laughs> because oh how the turntables <laughs> <laughs> but my point is People stayed up for that stuff because they were excited about Michael Jackson because they heard him over the radio. And they're like, hey, I want to be up for his release of his music video. And then some people didn't sleep that night because they thought Thriller was scary. Thriller was not scary. It was not. I don't... Well, give a take. I mean, maybe for, like, little, little kids. I mean, here's the thing. They didn't have the artistic 
detail that we have today to make things look more realistic. Like, it looked like literally well, yeah, in today's show. world, you could recreate the entire music video in CGI, and it yes. would look exactly the same as when it first released. Yes. But people were scared because people were scared. I, I don't know why people were scared. It was a Halloween theme song made in December during... Maybe Christmas that's time. why they were terrified. They were like, wait, I thought you were supposed to be gone. Why are you back? <laughs> Two months later, well... <laughs> I did not okay this. What happened? Honestly. But anyways, um, back to allowing millions to listen to popular songs. In 1927, the Nashville, Tennessee station WSM, don't tell me what that means because I could not figure out what it would meant. Either way, it was one of the earliest, earliest stations to start playing popular country blues and folk music. I mean, it's Tennessee, and Tennessee is one of those... Tennessee, <laughs> it makes sense. sense. <laughs> they have like the... Don't actually quote me on this. Isn't it like the... What is it? The they have like a music museum up there. The Rock I've, and Roll Hall of Fame. Yes, there we go. That's the that's what I was looking the, for. The the other big pyramid in Tennessee. <laughs> other than the pro, the Bass other Pro Shop. The Bass Pro Shop. <laughs> the Bass Pro Shop pyramid. Other than the um, Hall of Rock and Roll. But yeah, they pretty much were able to broadcast all these popular songs from these artists that aren't being heard in these places like in unknown places like i said you'll be listening let's say tennessee for example you'll be listening to elvis presley and the west hasn't heard about elvis presley and guess what when they hear him he goes boom people love him he becomes extremely popular and that's how things went you had entertainers go on the radio do their spiel being singing comedy stories reading the book war of worlds for an example and it became popular and people loved it and that's speaking of elvis I, when elvis was first like when elvis was first starting to get big yes like a bunch of people a bunch of like parents and like older generations hated him yeah i, I see a trend right now about that too <laughs> right um because of like the way that he would move around on stage and the, the yeah. various um, quote-unquote dance moves that he did. Yes. Right, a bunch of like parents are like, I don't want my children watching this garbage. And here we are in the 21st century saying, oh, he was fine. Well, yeah, compared to things today, Elvis was tame. Oh, yeah, very much so. Elvis very was much tame. So. Very tame to um, comparing to what we see today in like music videos. Like Cardi and... B music videos. Dude, those things are... Yeah, Ridiculous. little Nas X. Oh god. Yeah, little Nas X. Like, <laughs> bring back the Elvis levels of debauchery, please. Yes. Make things tame again. <laughs> like, oh no, just a little hip thrusting every now and again. Oh no. <laughs> oh no, he's sexualizing dancing. <laughs> Anyways, so, dancing like I feel like dancing was a uh, sexualized way before. Elvis, though. I mean, it probably was, but like I said, things weren't seen everywhere. And then Elvis came And now out. they are! And now they are. Yes, now they are. People see everything. Like I said, generalized, we see everything everywhere. Like, you can probably, like, look up, like, on my computer right now, I can look up security cameras in San Francisco, California. Why would you want to watch Californian security cameras? <laughs> I, I don't. I'm just giving an example. Is, you can literally see everything everywhere. Right there. Yes. I mean, you can probably get Sean to do that. I don't even Sean's... think Sean would have the patience for that. <laughs> I mean, he's got the cybersecurity degree. <laughs> I think that would be more reason why he wouldn't want to. <laughs> probably. Anyway, let's let's get back on track. So pretty much all these networks, like I said earlier, NBC, NS, MSN, BC. I mean, they weren't around then, but like ABC, C CBS, these networks grew because people wanted to listen to them having these artists, these comedians, and these art art authors come on and talk about their stuff and sing, read. You know what I'm saying. They grew so popular and aired 
popular influencers. It was all great. And they are still, obviously, like I said, NBC, ABC, and CBS, all are still in the major entertainment business today. But also they do yeah. cover... They own, movies. like, a couple of other things as well. Yeah, I mean, they own a lot. It's not like they were... They were bigger. They were cut down by anti monopolistic regulations done by the FCC. The Federal Communications Commission. Our favorite department. <laughs> I say that very sarcastically. <laughs> Anyways, that's kind of covers our social cultural impacts. Like I said, they basically, the radio gave listeners a way to keep up with events in their towns, cities, places around the country, and, well, not then, but now around the world. And they also enabled radio hosts to read stories with large audiences and allowed networks to grow by airing popular influencers, singers, songwriters, comedians, art authors, book writers, virtually everything. It was cool. Now, to our favorite impact, the political impact of radio broadcasting. Uh, yes, people could now hear their president speak. Yes. Now, it wasn't, like, too, too crazy until, like, I'm going to say between the 60s and the 80s, 19, 1960s to the 1980s, for the fact of how chaotic that time was. Because you had, let's say, the Cold War with the Korean War, the Vietnam War, you had the Civil <laughs> Rights Movement. Well, I don't know, World War II... Yeah, yeah. Well, right, that, World War II our, was 40s. What was it, 50s. Roosevelt's Fireside Chats? Yes. Actually, I want to talk about that. So the Fireside Chats by Franklin D. Roosevelt. I didn't realize how many messages he made. He made 27 messages, which doesn't seem a lot, but it, it was a lot for the amount of years that he was in office. Right, like, that's like one every couple of months. Yeah. And he kept the people updated. Like, So it was really interesting because when I was reading it, his intentions like, oh, I want to inspire the American people. But also you had the crises of the, uh, <laughs> the economic fallout of like the Great Depression. And you had like the, clo the closing of the National Bakes. Like it was not the best time, but... Not, for... not a good time, but hey, I've got this little radio box here that I can yeah. talk to people through. He's like, as long as the president was talking and people can hear him, people may or may not stay more calm and wouldn't go out and write and burn Walgreens and Wendy's. Anyways, um, most of these uh, talks, uh, millions of people, it reached millions. I think the average, or, ah, oh, what was it? The most famous radio talk he did, like out of those public messages, it reached between 30 and 40 million people. Like that's, that's crazy. 30 to 40 million people. Now, is that all in the U.S.? Or was people from other... Or was radio even strong enough to that? No, we're talking about the Fireside countries? Chats. I know we're talking about the Fireside Chats, but, like, was it just the Americans that were listening? Yeah, that was... Like... It was primarily the American people, like, the country. Like, we're, okay. we're going to say the country. And that's 30 to 40 million people. On average. It's crazy. It's cool. Oh, and then... I want to throw in a little fun fact because I feel like I skipped over this. So with World War One, they they suspended radios. <laughs> they pretty much suspended it because you know how it was what the early 1900s. So let's we're gonna say 1917. We're gonna say right dab in the middle. So with the new uprising with radios, um. They didn't have that all those regulations because the regulations didn't come until later. I, that was kind of like I believe the purpose of making the new government re regulations, which it took them almost ten years later to make it. That regulation, but they pretty much suspended radios because of the transmitting of frequencies. Like you don't want some guy in like a fort, let's say. Fort Sumter, I know it was from, from the Civil War, but we're going to see Fort Sumter for an example. And they're trying to talk to somebody in England. 
you don't want you don't want uh, an Elvis Presley song going through your message, and when they they get the message, you're like, wait a minute, this isn't the right message. Wait a minute, this why isn't am I listening Elvis to Presley Elvis Presley? Song. Yeah, exactly. Like you don't want that, and that's why they banned it because they didn't want people interfering with the frequencies of the military. The military didn't have their own things, and that's also one of the affiliated uh, channels that they did. The thirty seven affiliated channels um some of them were meant for the military so the military were able to do their own thing and not have issues with um interference so yeah that's that um treasury hour so this was about the same time this fireside chat so a little bit after um no 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 so it was World War II. This is World War II we're talking about here. So these treasury hours were basically propaganda ads. They're like, go, go buy the war bonds, support the war effort. And that was another way of advertising. It's, I, I, I said political, but I put a war twist on it. I, 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 when, I, when I say political, I think of politics and I think of war because it just, they match too closely. So They're basi- hand in hand. Yeah, they go hand in hand. Skipping off into the sunset. <laughs> sunset being a, well... A tank. Mushroom cloud. <laughs> a tank in front of a mushroom cloud. And a plane. A giant plane. Going at a 45 degree angle. Uh, <laughs> down towards the earth. So they catch speed. <laughs> if you don't get that reference, I'm sorry. Anyways... <laughs> Um, we're gonna move on to some more things. The Fairness Doctrine, uh, just about is after World War II, starting of the Cold War. Literally made by the FCC, our favorite department. The <laughs> They're Com- back at it again. <laughs> back at it again. They 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 kind of swoop in and then they disappear and then they swoop back in. It's like um, <laughs> they come in, they do something, and they leave. they kind of just look at it for a second, and go yup, and then leave. You're like, I don't like that. It's gone. And they're like, okay, everything's at peace. Not really. We're going to let it be for a couple of years and be like, okay, maybe we should have fixed that in the first place and not waited a couple of years to fix it. So, yeah, the fair- fairness doctrine, ugh, this is why we don't want the FCC. So, like, it, in short, I'm going to say it basically silenced people. It was a detriment to freedom of speech. To our first amendment, amendment freedom of speech. Because it basically had people had to... Watch what they say on the radio. So let's say you have, I'm going to say an example, Fox News and CNN have their two different stations. They're on the same channel. But this, well, I wouldn't say it was a detriment. I I take my words back. It's not really a detriment. It just kind of showed, hey, we need balance on TV shows, or not TV shows, radio shows, so your listeners and audience can understand each opinion. So let's say... Fox News says apples aren't good for you. This is just if. This is not actually true. Apples are good for you. You eat apple. Let's say Fox News says apples are bad. And they say because they are right. CNN can go and counteract, have a counter argument for that. And so you pretty much, this balance ensured um, one says it's good and one says it's bad. And they couldn't exactly say things without having the information, the evidence to back it up. Now, I kind of wish we did still have this now, actually speaking this into words. We probably should still have something borderline like this today, because not everybody backs up their information. Um, But the actual cause, or like the effect of this, basically discouraged stations to post political arguments which is not necessarily a bad thing but people need to still need to be informed about stuff that's going on war regulations policies rules actual events and facts yes and this this caused people not to talk about things when things needed to be talked about well there was a repeal for it <laughs> guess what guess what how many how many years later it took them to how many years? How many years we got going here? Four? Forty. Two? Forty! 
Actually, no, 38. I'm going to say, thir it, no. Yeah, 38. It was 30. Is it 38? No. It's, it's It was 1949 to 1987. I'm trying to get my... I can't do here, math in my head while I'm talking. Here's what we'll do. We'll pull get up the calculator. calculator. Get the calculator. 87 Hold on. I'm doing this right now. 49. 38 years. You were I was right. right. Okay, yeah, 30, 38 years. Wow. Okay, maybe I'm not that bad at math. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad to see that you've retained basic addition and subtraction skills, yes. Taylor. Thank you. But it was 38 years until they could repeal this. It took them 38 years. Well, give it take. We were going through the Cold War. There was a lot that was going on. There was a lot of stress. It's just and a little pressure. thing called the Cold War. Yeah, just a little tiny thing. It's not very important in all sarcasm. Um, basically, with this repeal, it allows stations to host programs without having to defend their opinion. That's short, simple, flat out statement. That's literally what it did. Allowed people to not have to always defend their opinion, but also encourage people to still defend their opinion because they didn't want to look stupid. It's, it is what it is. All right. Now that's for the uh, impacts of politics. The main big one was allowing government leaders to speak on their stances and long allowed them to talk to their supporters, like having the fireside chats and allowing them to advertise different opinions. Now you have like the Treasury Hour. That's what that did. It was advertising for the war effort so people would support them in war. And then you had, I wouldn't say, I, I, it's more of a social, but this had to do with government agencies and how people regulated things. So I felt like it was meant to be put into the political impacts. But because of the fairness doctrine and the repeal of it, I feel like it fell into this. So yeah, with that being said, that is all for radio broadcasting. Next, we have the history of the television. Ooh, excuse me, oh, I, had to, I had to burp a little bit. Our favorite thing. I'm not going to lie. I don't actually use my TV very, very much anymore. I was going to say, my TV, I, my TV is mainly utilized by my parents. I just end up watching stuff like on my computer mm -hmm. or my phone. No, I, actually, I do. I do use my TV sometimes. Yes. So, for the amount of TVs I have my in my in my home, I, the one I usually use is the one in my room because it has my Nintendo Switch plugged up and I watch YouTube on it. That is that is what I use all the time, pretty much every day. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a TV. All right, <laughs> let's let's actually talk about the history. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, we Just love how many TVs. TVs does Taylor have? How many TVs? I'm not gonna count that because that's just that's a lot. That's a lot of counting. Well, not a lot of counting. I just don't want to count on. It's it's, it's not relevant. All right, anyways. Here we can do we can do it like um like Sesame Street or something. Well, we get the count. One. You gotta, two. You gotta do it like the count. Be like. One TV. Ah, ah, ah. Please, God, never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> On this episode of the podcast, Taylor <laughs> imitates the count. <laughs> hey, bro, that's, that this... Count Chocula cereal, though. Oh, October's no. over, though. I missed the Count Chocula cereal. I'm it so was, upset. It was. It, you, did you not get any? No. Man. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't see any commercials for it on TV. <laughs> well, it's always in stores. They have the boo the booberry. They have the um, the count chocula, the booberry, and the there's one Frankenstein more. one. It's like strawberry yeah. or something like that. Yeah, but no one ever gets that. No, I've never eaten that one. I don't think I have either. I've always had count chocula or booberry, but I didn't get any this year. Actually, I haven't eaten cer cereal in a while. Anyways, we're getting off topic. We need to get back to history. The history of television. Yay! Let's go. History of television. So, pretty much. Uh, the idea... Box uh, with pretty LED screen. That's Ooh. what it is today. That's nice. They didn't have LEDs. LEDs didn't exist. <laughs> In the 1800s. So about the same time radio was... Booming. Not really booming. The idea of it where... Um, Mr. Marconi was telling the Italian government that he was going to England for money and funding for his radio. Um, 1876 was the earliest dated back to the idea of televisions. Now, what I didn't know prior to this, like, 
research of his, the history of television that there were two types of like key inventions that led up to what we have today or somewhat to what we have today i'm gonna say probably up until the 60s and 70s like 1960s and 1970s that um we had the tvs we have today but for the time being when i say today i mean like the brink of the 21st century like it was not 2000 yet um so the, like two the 90s or, or uh 80s and 90s 80s and okay. 90s okay so the two types so there's still electronic electronic being oh gosh it's i'm gonna say it's, it's called the crt for short but it's like cathode ray ray tube tube like r-a-y and then tube um that was created so actually both of these types were created by a german scientist which I find very interesting anyways um for the crt German physicist Carl Fernand Braun. In the eighteen mid mid late eighteen nineties, um, this gentleman, this physicist, uh, basically combined pieces of early cameras and electricity, and tried to. Oh, hold on, <coughs> excuse me. Basically. Um, have these on a screen, like use the camera as a screen, and then with the electricity, he had it emit light and it created an image by hitting electrons. It was a very sophisticated um, invention. Like very most fancy. things, most things when they first start out, they're huge. Like computers were huge when they first made them. Cameras, I mean, they were still pretty big, but they were standstill. You just couldn't carry one around all the time. They're not as mobile as they are today. Early cameras, you had to like legitimately stand there and pose. Put for, a sheet like, over half your head. An hour. <laughs> yeah, put a sheet over well, your it head. It took like half an hour for the actual picture to be taken. Yes. Right. Yeah. Originally, having your picture taken was like this huge. It was like, it was a huge family event. It was a whole ordeal. It was cool. It was exciting. It and was that's why weird. no one smiled in them because you didn't want to hold a smile for like 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But he pretty much put a camera and electricity together, making this um, CRT. And what he originally called it was the cathode ray osculoscope. I think I pronounced that correctly. Like I said, there was a screen in mid light through an image hitting electrons and may displayed an image. Really cool. The concept. I wish I can show pictures, but like this was very sophisticated now if you want to know something very even more sophisticated is the mechanical uh scanning disc which projected images when spun like when i looked at this when i was looking up this research and saw the image of this i'm like this is a literally like think of the early flying saucers poke holes into it spin it and it was like a literal fidget spinner <laughs> literally like Just... you spin it and it made images with light, as actually, I say that like a fidget spinner, but as long as you shoot light into it, it made an image. It's really cool, very fascinating. I thought it was like how fast um, did you have to spin the thing? Um, you know, I don't know. If you think of because I, you would think it would be pretty quick. Yeah, you you would think so, but like, um, actually, yeah, it would be really quick. If you have you seen those new fidget spinners? I mean, I know they're not really in trend, but like, you always see those um indie companies to start making fidget spinners and they add like little pictures like stop motion it's like it's like a stop motion picture like you make it move one and then you move it like an inch and then you move the other one an inch until like it makes an action and when you spin it it forms into like one image and it moves because it's moving so fast it's, it's just really cool like i wish i could show this like i said i'd show it on screen but it's a podcast it's not a video um, the best way you can think of it is like think of Sonic and then like rolling into a ball and then or just running in general like someone basically put a stick figure and made it look like Sonic and just like moved him ever so lightly so it looked like he was running and then when you spin the fidget spinner it looked like Sonic was running <clears throat> I thought it was very interesting though That's that it was, it's amazing it amazes me how people put time in that. I don't think I have the patience for that. I don't think I would either, to be honest. 
Like, I did a stop-motion Lego movie for a project back in high school, and... Motion takes hours to do It does, that. yeah. Like, just for one little scene? Yeah. Or, like, mm -hmm. someone bouncing a basketball. That's, like, three hours of work. Yeah. I have it on a flash drive video. somewhere. If I can find the flash drive, I would love to show you guys. Because I made that. It was so cool. I made that stop motion. I made um, a music video cover of uh, Hall of Fame. If you've seen that. I don't know the... What was, what's the... Um, I don't know the band name. But the song was called Hall of Fame. What's, I know what Oh, it's like scripted about. or something? Scripts? Yeah. Uh, scripts? Yeah. So... Yeah, that was cool. That was also really bad because the the uh, Adobe, um, not Illustrator, one of the Adobe softwares was delayed and I didn't sync it correctly, so the render was a second behind. So you see somebody talking, like singing the song, but like the audio was another thing. It was, it was a disaster, but it was cool <laughs> because I was a sophomore in high school and I was working with a bunch of seniors. Like, think about that. Freshman or sophomore working with seniors. Like, you thought you were the coolest person ever. Oh, dude, you were the coolest cat. That's ever. that's really what it came down to. I was working right, with a bunch of seniors. Everybody wanted to be you. Exactly. I was in I was in a higher advanced media class for that. That was fun. <laughs> Anyways, continuing on these types of inventions. So you have these two types of inventions. The scanning disc in the mid 1880s and then you have the CERT in 1890s I'm gonna say 1897 um, in 1907 the beginning of the 20th century we had somebody combine these two items a Russian scientist by the name of Boris Rosing Rosing Boris Boris oh, Rosing. the name Boris will never not be fun <laughs> You're going to name your kid Boris? No. <laughs> I think Riley would enjoy that. <laughs> I don't think... Listen, I'm not Russian. I'm not naming my child Boris. But I just think the name Boris is just funny. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> I always think of Loa in Men in Black 3. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Boris. <sighs> just Will Smith standing on top of a rocket pad just Boris <laughs> <laughs> oh such my. a weird movie it's, 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 it's Men in Black what do you expect they put the time travel in the Men in Black <laughs> <laughs> alright so our friendly Russian scientist decided to combine these two inventions and the bulk of it was the CRT but he basically had the spinning disc in the light that shows through a screen. So, like, um... Is this how we got, like, movie reels? Pretty much. Is this, that's, you're, that's... Is this where this is going? This is how reels, like... And, like, the it would be, like, in, like, Tom and Jerry or something. Like, mm -hmm. the, the reel would... Yeah. Like, you put it up everywhere in front of the screen. And it would be this black tape of reel. Mm -hmm. And it would go in, like, Tom would, like, try and shove the reel back into the little spinny thing. And then Jerry would walk up and hit it with a hammer. <laughs> Like, so when, just just fun stuff like yeah. that. But when I when I was looking this up, I didn't specifically see that. That's well more... because it sounds similar. Yeah. So right because the film reels what is it what they are they're just images that are spun very fast in front of a light source, mm -hmm. which is then projected onto the screen. And that's pretty much what this was. So then so, yeah. yeah, it's like this the, goes uh, in that direction. I personally didn't take it in that direction when I was doing my research, but that's. What it comes down to, that's literally what it was. So basically, Boris is like, hey, you want to see a movie? <laughs> he probably didn't say that, but that's that's what he pretty much made. Hey, a little Boris, short do you want to see clip. a movie? <laughs> like, I think of, like, the Wild West, like, town movie theaters, and you have, like, the real, like, if you... Th I, I, I doubt um, anybody who is not a gamer would get this, but if you go back to playing, like, uh, Black Ops... Call of Duty Black Ops 1 Zombies Kirino Dirtoden and you go up into the like the movie theater booth and you see the the um tape and you collect the tapes when you go through power to get you turn on the power to go through the teleporters literally those tapes is what that was that's what we're trying to describe here and I think of that you know, in a room. you know Dirtoden was oh <laughs> I'm bringing I'm I'm think I'm making you think nostalgically but this is not the you, time you're, for it. You're, you're bringing <laughs> I'm up nostalgia us. with Kino. I'm, I'm throwing us off a whole other path. 
Honestly. But I'm trying to describe how this looks, and this is not the best way to describe what it looks. Like, well, like I said, it's, the, it's a little... If you just it's, think about it, it's old-timey, like, film reels, is what they are. Yes. Anyways. This so... man says, Boris has created the modern <laughs> film. Congratulations, <laughs> Boris. Thanks to you, we have cinem cinematic masterpieces such as Rango <laughs> and Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. <laughs> oh, man. Two very different films. So, moving on, um, we now have a British pioneer. Now, when I was reading about this gentleman, John Logie Barrett, Bard Barrett. I'm sorry, what was his name? John L Logie Logue. L O G I G, okay. no, L O G I E, and then Barry. Logie. That is that is a weird name. We'll name him J L B because we have JLB. a hard time pronouncing things today. Wait a minute, switch that around. You get L B J. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> Lyndon B Johnson is that you? This is 1926. <laughs> No, it makes LBJ's grandfather. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> Lyndon B. Johnson, where you at? LB? Oh my gosh. Um, so basically, in 1926, this British pioneer—I call him a tryhard because the research I found is he tried everything to perfect this to make sure the public would be happy with it and people would invest into it. So he pretty much. Um, Ah, what's the word? Mastered um, Boris Rosing's invention of the primitive television is what the best way I can say I can put this. So he took what Boris did and then he improved upon it. Yes, and called it the mechanical scanning disk system okay. and presented it to the public in a demonstration in London. But he did it wirelessly. Or not, not wirelessly, but like by cables. So like if you... But like an actual screen now. So you have a TV. Let's say um, you have an apartment. And you have a TV in your apartment. And you're filming this. Let's say. Outside your apartment. On the first floor. And you're on the third floor. The people could see what's going on. On the third floor through that TV. While you're filming it on the first floor. He was able to split it up. So you didn't have to be in the same room. And it actually like worked. That made no sense did it. Um, so, using... so wait, there were, he connected, he was able to, so it was like live. Yes. So, okay. So he was able to film something with a camera and then like you could watch it on the TV as it was happening. Correct. That is, see, this is why I needed you here. You, you, you make it so much easier <laughs> to explain I things. I translate your ramblings. You, yes, I ramble and you translate it. And it's great. So, not only did John J. L. B. do this, Mr. John, um, at the same time, which I thought was really interesting, not even connected, not even like related, a, a, a gentleman named a young kid named Charles Jenkins, an American actually from the Midwest, um, did the exact same thing, modeling this m mechanical scanning disk system. And this is around, getting close to, I believe, World War II. And unfortunately, he did not make money doing that. He wanted to make money out of it, and that's why he created it. He did not make money off of it, which was really interesting, because you think you make money off of something that small of an invention, but at the same time, you had a lot of people who were very skeptical about new things, and people are still skeptical about a lot of new things, like the iPhone uh, face recognition people don't like it but it's new it's cool so it is innovative yes yes very innovative people didn't like all innovative things because they didn't know what it did what the effect of it was so not everybody looked into it world war ii came around he didn't make the money he wanted to it failed he kind of fell out of it um now pushing back to government regulations and stuff because that's important in the television history. <clears throat> so, it's not the FCC. It's the FRC. The Federal Radio Commission. Which, I don't know why they had different commissions. They were pretty much the same thing. At this point, I believe they've merged at some point. 
which I don't think I actually wrote down. Anyways, um, they did a Dragon Ball Z and fused together. And, <laughs> yeah, they they fused. They did. They're the, the two presidents of each organization came together and did the fusion dance in the off in one of their offices. <laughs> yeah, be like the RCA, the FRC became the FCC. <laughs> <laughs> the, bane of you, the bane of the content creator. Yes. So anyways, uh, this is still... Uh, television was still on its move of being popular. Um, at this time, let's see. Radio was still booming, or becoming booming. This was before the uh, Radio Act of 1927. Because this is 1926. Crazy. <clears throat> Uh, all the TV stuff was before. Though? Yeah, it was weird. It, it, they were kind of like at the so same time. Kind of hap- yeah, they were happening at the same. Time. They, they were kind of happening at the same time. They were intersecting, intervening, and like, it's weird because you think about it. Because you had all these inventions happen and be created. Well, the the TV, the, like the 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 television for the home consumer, wasn't until like what the fifties, sixties. Yes, but the television wasn't like crazy till the 60s and 70s because people can see things on screen and this tvs will actually talk about this um tvs became a really big thing in the 60s because they were able to see war because it was covered on tv which we'll talk about as an impact that's that's technically changes it really doesn't um i don't want to skip all the stuff uh, I have written down because I feel like it's important. More of the history. We're going to kind of jump around with this. Um, the FCR, no, the FRC uh, basically started to regulate televisions because of the population, the popularity of it. So like how now, when you say grew- regulate, are you talking like they regulated what could be shown on it or like how uh, they were made? The policies, like how the um, Radio Act made the different channels the 600 channels, and then they had the... So they regulated what could be shown on the TV? Yeah, that... Okay. Yeah. You, I don't know why I didn't say yes to that. <laughs> so, with that popularity booming, and then you had World War II, unfortunately, the, the uh, manufacturing of TVs, televisions, stopped. Or not at an all-complete stop, but like a slowed, because... They needed the funding. They're not funding. I can't get my words out. The manufacturing of equipment and stuff was kind of first once, you know, Pearl Harbor happened and the U.S. became involved in World War II. Um, and plus they were expensive. TVs were expensive. Like, think about it this way. Yeah. They costed between 200 and $600. Which That's... back then it was a lot of money. Yes. Now, I actually did the math. And that's that comes out to today's money between three to nine thousand dollars. <laughs> Dude, you could buy a car for that much. Money. Yes, it, it, they were expensive. It, they were expensive. It was a privilege to have a television. Um, they were the sales, like I said, where they were suspended, and that kind of pushed them to not make them as much because war, war was on everybody's thing. mind. It was a thing. Yes, war was a thing. So with that being said. Post, I'm going to jump again and say post-World War II. Um, everything kind of came back to normal. You had your radio companies, um, networks, NBC and CBS, uh, become the big thing. The ones that were viewing everything, they became rivals. No kidding, because everything becomes rivals. When there's two companies fighting for the same thing, they're rivals. Let's be honest. And the FCC, they come back. <laughs> back at it again <laughs> back at it again they intervened and actually set these standards like an actual official set standards for broadcasting like they did with radios and so not till like the 1950s televisions really started to blow up i mean they've always been around but like they weren't like oh my gosh we have to have one not until the 1950s not till after world war ii and the first colorized television and that broadcast was aired in 1954 by NBC. They won the war. That's what happened. Between the two rivalries, they won the war. <laughs> and then we're going to jump again to 1972, where color TVs were more... Actually, I should back this up. Black. Everything was in black and white up until 1954. 
and oh yeah, now come... that we're on TVs, I yes. can bring up Nixon and Kennedy, the first ever presidential debate aired live on television. That is true. Yes, and like I said, nineteen seventy-two. That was when color TVs were more common than black and white TVs, and then obviously nowadays you have cable HD and digital. So that's that's the, the small short history. Sorry, that took a lot longer than <laughs> it was. It was a small information, and we kind of pulled off path. No worries, but we're still trekking along. We're talking about it's the impacts, all good. the impacts of television. Now, this is where it gets good. The social and cultural impacts of television. The show set standards to how people should live. And that's still going on today. You watch something on the TV and you're like, I should be like that person. And that's why I'm saying the 1950s were like a big thing. Because, well, they showed what the standard should be for a middle class family. Specifically, a white American middle class family that hold conservative values. And that was just kind of like the spiel back then. And... They avoided political and social issues with this, which was interesting. Like, these TV shows that they put out, they were, like, meant to be funny. They were supposed to be the ideal family. And, well, I mean, it still shows today. Like, pe there's shows out there, I couldn't give you an example because I don't really watch TV nowadays. Any, like, sick, not really sitcoms, but, like, those real-life Hallmark TV shows, if you want to call those what you want as an ideal family they're all about romance i guess most things nowadays they're i'm gonna say romanticized homework. yes and then you have your building shows you're like this is how your house is supposed to look in such and such time but yeah so like examples of like actual tv shows that were like idolizing like the standard family like you have leave it to the beaver the donna reed show and adventures of ozzy and Harriet. Now, I couldn't tell you anything about these TV shows because I didn't hear about these TV shows until I looked up this information. Now, most of these shows had those time segments, and this is where the 30 minutes to an hour shows nowadays come into play because most of these shows' episodes had 30-minute things, 30-minute time frames to fill until the next one came up. And I'm going back to the whole avoiding political and social issues. I found it very interesting that they didn't do that. Um, we'll give it take it was the 1950s. And the civil rights wasn't like a big push until the 1960s. So um, what I'm trying to say here is there wasn't a lot of good like African-American like people of color shows out there. To later on because i guess i guess you can say we were discriminating in the 50s I, I i don't think it was a you could say we yes there was rampant discrimination yes and if you were in one of those idolized white american middle class families with conservative values they had one or two like people of color persons in it and like an example like i was looking up uh the show Father Knows Best was named Frank Smith. Who comes up with these names? I, I couldn't tell you who comes up with these names because they're weird. Frank, Frank Smith. Not Frank to be confused Smith. with his brother, John Smith. Yes. Not the same person. Um, In this show, they had a Hispanic gardener. Like, I think that's where like these stereotypes come from. Like, You watch TV and everyone assumes, hey, that person over there and this TV show must be real, so everyone else is going to be doing that same job. It's not true. It's sad, because, well, they were discriminating. Might not fully influence to that degree, but, like, subtle influences. Yeah, subtle influences. Or, like, maybe that uh, Hispanic guy was cast as the gardener because of that stereotype. That is, yes, that is also true. Because of the stereotype, some things happened on TV shows, and then vice versa anyways so my next thing i want to bring up is the the fact that like radio uh television was there to keep viewers distracted by current events let me guess we had world war one world war two the cold war with the korean war the vietnam war the civil rights movement the assassination of JS jfk you had the cuban missile crisis there was a lot going on when tv was becoming a big thing so you had TV shows that 
were meant to distract you. Like Gunsmoke, for an example. And then, be oh, well, it aired between 1955 and 1975, like a Wild West show. I've actually, since my grandparents watch this show, I actually, every once in a while, when I'm over at their house and I watch this, I'm like, this is really cool. Just, you don't see Wild West shows that, like, covers different social issues and violence like Gunsmoke. Like, there's nothing like it. And I think it's a pretty cool show. It was meant to distract people from what was going on in their time, in the current event. Because everyone... I mean, it definitely worked. Oh, yeah. And then you have this other show named I Dream of Je Janie. Genie. I'm going to say Genie because... Yeah, it's it's genie. It was basically a sci-fi twist of like a genie who marries an astronaut. It makes no sense, and I'm like, I wonder who made that up. I mean, oh yeah, at the same time, it, you have like well, people they, wanting well, this space exploration. Well, when was that? The '60s, the '70s? It was the '60s. It was the '60s. <laughs> I wonder why. Uh, it's not like uh, we the space or anything. Space. Actually, no, that was later. <laughs> What it was? And then going into the 70s... Uh, it was oh, 60s and know. 70s. And, like, yeah. an, another show that, like, I, I've even watched on my own time because I, I think it's funny. It's a sitcom. Gilligan's Island. Have you, never, have you I, not seen... We I need, don't know that one. We need to sit down and watch it. Like, I, I want to watch it again. Like, it's so nostalgic okay. to watch. It's a good show. It's basically a boat tour group. Like, like goes on a... Like, a, literally, it's a boat tour, and then, like, a storm comes out when they were, like, vibing, and they get stranded on an island, and that's the show. They're on the island, how they survive, and they do different things, oh, so and they like run lost. into different situations. Yeah. Okay. It's, 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 um, it started out in black and white, and then it came out in color, and then they did, like, a anniversary for it. I wouldn't say just recently, but in the last couple years, they did something. I thought it was really okay. cool. I enjoyed the show, at least. I mean, I'd love to go watch it casually casually like no intention just watch it because it's funny like i it's funny because i used to just like listen to the jingle like the theme song the main theme the music it's it's so <laughs> taylor's nostalgia has been touched i i have been touched by nostalgia it's such a good show i'll keep i'm gonna keep saying that and then we're gonna get nowhere anyways we're gonna go move on to the political impacts because i have about 10 minutes until i have to leave for work oh so Okay, we're going to speed this up then. <laughs> at least we're at the end. We were talking about the political impacts of television. Now, you yeah. were talking about, like, the first televised broadcast of, like, a... Yeah, so the first television televised broadcast of a presidential debate was John F. Kennedy uh, debating Richard Nixon. And everybody who watched the debate on television declared that Kennedy undoubtedly won the debate. But anyone who listened to it on the radio said that Nixon had far better arguments and he won the debate. And what's interesting about that is because Kennedy knew that people were actually like looking and watching him. So he put on this huge air of confidence and he looked like super comfortable with being there. While Nixon over on the other hand was like sweating and like his eyes were darting back and forth. And he just looked really nervous about answering all the questions. It I, it looked like Kennedy like held the entire debate in the palm of his hand. Yeah. But in reality, Nixon's arguments and policies were superior. Yeah. But, but Kennedy ended up winning <laughs> the presidency. I mean, really, like depending on how you viewed it or how you heard it, like really twisted like how you thought about your opinion. And that's that's the cool thing about technology nowadays. Like depending on how you see it is depending on how you view it and how you gain an opinion. And so, along with that, you had different um, crazy things. Everything was televised. And, like, most of the things were televised in the 60s and 70s. So you can talk about the missile crisis, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And um, I don't think I need to I go mean, into... You can watch this moon landing. Yeah, the moon landing. You can watch, unfortunately, the first televised war in Vietnam. And how American soldiers ended up burning and killing villagers that ended up actually not being the Viet Cong, the communist, the people they were How originally looking for. How to lose the hearts and minds of the people. Yes. In just three easy steps. Yes. Number Step one, one commit war crimes. <laughs> Step two, televise it. 
Step three, profit. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. And the one, so I took a whole class on uh, Vietnam, like the whole Vietnam War, the 60s and 70s. Like, we actually saw a video of like the POWs and the actual Vietnamese villages getting burned and the people being shot. The prisoner of war conditions were insane. Like, just like no, like an actual American POW. It was so weird. Like. The 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 um North Vietnamese like wanted to be filmed. Like, <laughs> like they let they let American media, uh, host and cameramen camera crews go to their POW POW camps, and talk to the prisoners of war. Like it, it it sounds so insane. Like you saw pictures and videos of people in cages like like uh, like uh, tiger cages like they're on their knees hunched over because they can't sit up and if they move they get like poked by like their the guard or something and then you had now this was this was really really it was a lot they tied their prisoners to trees and you were lucky enough not to be attacked by ants it was it was sad, and the problem is this was all covered by CBS. <laughs> like it just it's bad. Like just just filming this dude getting eaten alive by ants. Like thank you. Yeah, like we definitely want to see that, and you know, this this kind of divides our communities, and that's what my post that my kind of one of my points I wanted to make was these political impacts, the impacts of TV, and radio, definitely divided communities based off of what they viewed and see on TV. And it's it's unfortunate how this came about, but now we know we don't we don't do that anymore. We don't we don't need stuff like the Vietnam War to happen again. Yeah, to probably not a good idea to redo that little fiasco. Yeah. So um, to keep moving on because we're on a time stamp now, but it's fine. Um, you talked about the. Um, JFK and Nixon. Um, mm -hmm. Also, JFK's assassination was on TV. That was yeah. that was another thing. So along with being divided, um, which also opinions. led to like one of the b biggest conspiracy theories of all time. Yes, TV causes conspiracy theories. It causes support for people, politicians, and it causes division. People Every, believe everything. Really dumb things. Yeah. It's it's really weird. We actually did a whole lesson on conspiracy theories. It's cool. Well, because they've proved they've debunked the JFK mm -hmm. assassination, like curved bullet, whatever. Yeah, and then like the assassin got assassinated. <laughs> well, he did. Yes, I mean he actually did. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying <laughs> that's not a, that's not a conspiracy. Did. Yeah, he, it was that's not a conspiracy theory. Like he literally did on TV. That also happened on TV. He was getting handcuffed and walking out and the guy came up to him and shot him it's you can't make this stuff up it's it's crazy it's interesting and that is <laughs> on a positive <laughs> on a more positive note martin luther king's i have a dream speech yeah that right that, that, that was, was televised as well yes it it brings people together it shows that was during the civil rights movement it shows how people can come together in tough times I, that's that's all I have for that. That's I'm, I'm not gonna lie. There's nothing to it. Everything was televised. The civil rights movement was. Those demonstrations were photographed, televised. The sea. The water cannon, like the the fire trucks mm -hmm. blasting people with water. Yes. Right, like people who normally wouldn't see that kind of stuff on a day to day basis had it suddenly shoved in their face, and I'm pretty sure like a big reason that the civil rights movement was such a success was because it was televised. That is true. Because people, people who lived, seen things. People who lived up in, like, Maine and had seen a African-American person maybe, like, twice in their entire life suddenly were watching these people getting blasted by fire trucks on live television. And they're like, that's, uh... That's not right. That's not right. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's the cool thing about television. I mean, not that people were getting shot, but the fact of showing people things that are a problem and having them gain support for causes and such. And so to tie everything up together, um, 
radio broadcasting and television have definitely impacted everybody's life in some way shape or form from where you're watching this to where you're listening in your car listening to the radio watching tv on your in your game room or your bedroom because of all of these different things but because of radio broadcasting because of television broadcasting we've been brought together in new and interesting ways that people 200 years ago would have never even fathomed yes you you got it you hit it right on the right on the nail i am the king of translations <laughs> thank you so anyways that will be all thank you guys for listening for this hour and a half just about um if you uh like to see another episode of some sort um please let me know down in the comments like and subscribe i'd like to thank my professor again for allowing me to do a podcast for my project and thank you eric for um participating in my project. i showed up <laughs> you showed up so thank you again and that will be all for the Rogue Gang podcast. <laughs>